Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Social Security Committee and in 2018 and um, remind everyone to turn their mobile phones off as they may interrupt the broadcasting. No apologies have been received for today's meeting. There is only one item on the agenda, the consideration of Social Security Bill at stage two. The deadline for lodging amendments has passed, so the marshal list and groupings cover all remaining amendments, and we will continue where we left off last week. Um, there are 23 groups of amendments up to the end of the bill, um, and we have around till 11.30 this morning, um, but we will um, uh, have an opportunity to complete today if we get through them all, but unlikely. Um, but um, just to let everyone know that we'll be um, pressing on with that today. Um, can I welcome the Minister to the um, committee again this morning with her morning. accompanying officials. And we will now start stage two proceedings. I want to draw members' attention to the fact that amendments 69 and 166 appear in the wrong order on the marshalled list. Amendment 69 should be disposed of before amendment 166. When we reach that point in proceedings, I will call Amendment 69 before moving to Amendment 166, and I will remember, remind members again when we reach that point. Thank you. Um, so I uh, call uh, Amendment 222 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I move formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 22A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 22B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I call Amendment 22C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not move. So I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment to 22. Press. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. We now move to the first grouping today, um, uh, which is on means testing, and I call Amendment 184 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendments 185, 186, 187, 25A, 188, 27A, 190 and 30A. Um, I invite Mr Griffin to move Amendment 184 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, move Amendment 184 in my name. Um, Amendments 188, 190, 27A and 30A would ensure that disability and employment injuries benefits can't be means tested by the current or future governments. That would replicate the uh, current policy for both, which are not currently means tested. Um, and for disability assistance, it would enshrine in law the protection offered in both the SNP and Labour Holyrood manifestos, which stated uh, we will protect disability benefits and ensure that they remain non means tested, and disability benefits will be rights based, not means tested. In keeping with the uh, Labour, SNP, and Tory 2017 manifesto commitments, um, I'm also seeking to ensure that winter fuel payments remain universal through Amendments 184. To 188 and 25A. Um, um, all of these amendments are supported by Citizens Advice Scotland. Um, and I feel that there's a, a risk that a, a reduction in the winter fuel payment or a restriction on who receives it could result in a loss of income for 
some consumers and a universal approach within the whole population is the most effective and efficient means um, of achieving the, what I think is the desired outcome for all of us, which is maximising incomes of low incomes and vulnerable households for help with the heat costs during the, the winter months. Um, these amendments prevent this and future governments from means testing winter fuel payments, um, but don't restrict the regulations from um, basing eligibility on other means tested benefits. Um, and this would um, allow the government to continue to pay um, any additional uh, premiums or, or top ups to, to winter fuel um, payments. Um, using the eligibility criteria, which may be based on um, other things like pension credit or council tax reduction or, or housing benefit. Um, and I would ask committee members to support uh, the, the amendments in my name in this group. Thank you. Um, do any other members of the committee wish to contribute to the debate? No. Um, Minister, would you like to? Yeah, uh, briefly, Convener, if I may. Um, we've uh, made a clear and consistent commitment that winter heating, disability and employment injury assistance would not be means tested. So I welcome our policy commitments reflected on the face of the bill and support all of the amendments in this group. Thank you. Um, can I ask Mr Griffin to wind up our press's amendment? Uh, simply press um, amendment uh, 184. Thank you. The question is that 184 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 185 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 184. Mr Griffin, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 185 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 186 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 184, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 186 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 187 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 184, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 187 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment, one, uh, call amendment sorry, 24 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Call Amendment 24A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 24B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. And I call Amendment 24C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. So I ask uh, if the Minister is to press or withdraw Amendment 24. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 25 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 20 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 25A in the name of Mark Griffin already debated with Amendment 184 and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. And ask if the Minister wishes to press or withdraw Amendment 25. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <coughs> Thank you. And the question is that Schedule 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 67 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 182. Mr Balfour, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Um, we are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Um, can I ask all members um, in support of Amendment 67 to please raise their hands? And those against? So the result of the Division where five votes for and four votes against. Amendment 67 is therefore agreed. Um, and the question is that section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes, thank you. Call amendment 68 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 182, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
Um, uh, there will be a division. Um, can I ask those in favour of Amendment 68 to please raise their hands? Those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. The results of the division are five votes for and four votes against, no abstentions. Um, amendment 68 is therefore agreed. As explained earlier, I will now call Amendment 69 before Amendment 166. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 182, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. We now move to um, the next group, which is equal consideration of different impairments. And I call Amendment 166 in the name of Mark Griffin, in a group on its own, and ask Mr Griffin to move and speak to Amendment 166. Thank you, Commissioner. I move um, Amendment 166 in my name. Um, amendment 166 will ensure secondary legislation on disability assistance requires equal consideration of different disabled impairments, irrespective of whether they are physical or mental. The amendment will prevent circumstances such as the recent um, changes to personal independence payment the UK Government um, have accepted are unlawful. Uh, the changes in March last year prevented people with mental health problems or psychological distress from being eligible for the enhanced mobility component for PIP. I think it was last week the Minister confirmed that the Government would ensure that the regulations uh, were never replicated in the new Scottish system um, and I welcome that commitment and this amendment seeks to make that a reality on the face of this bill. Um, in practice, this will prevent the intru introduction of regulations which create different or discriminatory eligibility criteria or levels of payment for people with mental health problems compared to people with physical health conditions. And I ask members to support um, Amendment 166. Thank you. Um, do any of the committee members wish to contribute to the debate? Um, and ask the minister. To much. Um, I agree with the principle that underpins this amendment, that individuals deserve to be awarded support based on their needs and the impact their condition has on their day-to-day -day life. This has been, as Mr Griffin says, a key and persistent criticism of the current DWP system. But this is already well rooted in the provisions of the bill, particularly as a result of the amendments this committee has agreed, that the system must promote the goals of equality and non-discrimination. The amendment, as drafted, achieves the opposite, I believe, of the outcomes Mr Griffin intends. It says the regulations must not in any way differentiate between individuals on the basis of whether their impairment is physical or mental. This will actually prevent the Scottish Government from responding to particular needs or reconciling our operational practice in a positive way for those with mental health conditions. It also overlooks the fact that disability assistance will be given to people with a terminal illness. Assistance will be provided rapidly to individuals who suffer from a progressive and life-limiting illness, but that illness may not affect the person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, and their needs will not be long-term. An unintended, I'm sure, but critical consequence of this amendment would be to prevent disability assistance being given solely because a person is terminally ill. So I would ask Mr Griffin not to press his amendment. The, dra the bill as drafted already allows for specific eligibility criteria to be adequately and properly dealt with in regulations. Crucially, that allows consultation with users to ensure specific needs, whether physical or mental, are considered and prepared for. And such regulations will be subject to scrutiny, and the Parliament will have an opportunity to offer its views on our proposals. Thank you. Minister, can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and press a withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Kimira. I welcome the, the Minister's comments, particularly on the agreement of the, the policy intent with this amendment. I do take on board the concerns, particularly around how this could impact um, on those with a terminal illness. Um, and we'll seek, um, with the committee's permission, to withdraw Amendment 166. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, call Amendment 70 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 188 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 184, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 188 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Thank you. Call Amendment 26A in the name of Mark Griffin, already amendment, debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 26B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 26C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. The question is, oh, sorry. I ask the Minister to withdraw or press Amendment 26. I to press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 189 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 182, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 27A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 184, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that 27A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes, thank you. And I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 27. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Schedule 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Mm. And the question is that section 15 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now call amendment 71 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call amendment 28 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 20, and ask the minister to move formally. Formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Mark Griffin. Already 28E, pardon, uh, in the name of Mark Griffin. Already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr. Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 28B in the name of Mark Griffin. Already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr. Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 20C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 28. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Schedule 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Okay. Thank you. And the question is that section 16 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now call amendment 72 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Call amendment 190 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 184, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 190 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 29 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 29A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 29B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. I call Amendment 29C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 29. 
Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 29 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 30 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to formally move. Moved formally. Thank you. Um, call Amendment 30A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 184, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. So the question is that Amendment 30A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 30. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Schedule 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And the question is that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now call Amendment 73 in the name of Jerry Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 31 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. Call Amendment 31A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 31B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I call Amendment 31C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 31. Press. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 32 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And the question is that sexual, uh, Schedule 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And we move to the next grouping of amendments, which are on housing assistance. And I call Amendment 152 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 153, 161 and 165 and ask the Minister to move Amendment 152 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, in moving uh, 152 and the other amendments in this group, uh, this will allow us to deliver on our existing commitments to mitigate two areas of UK government uh, cuts to housing assistance, the bedroom tax and the removal of housing support costs for 18 to 21 year olds. In general, the abolition of the bedroom tax through universal credit can be regulated for using the universal credit flexibility in the Scotland Act. But in order to ensure that the support we provide to those to whom the tax applies is not limited by the operation of the UK government's benefit cap, we need to create an additional payment to be made in those circumstances where the award would otherwise be reduced by the cap. The amendments create the power for ministers to introduce regulations to deliver such an additional payment, which will be delivered through universal credit as part of the technical solution to mitigate the bedroom tax in full. On support for 18 to 21 year olds, members will recall that the UK government cut housing support for universal credit recipients aged 18 to 21. Despite creating some exemptions, it will still leave a proportion of 18 to 21 year olds ineligible for support for housing costs. We did take immediate steps to put in place an interim solution using the Scottish Welfare Fund, but it was always recognised that this would be a temporary measure. These amendments allow us to introduce housing assistance for this group to ensure that all 18 to 21 year olds are able to get help with housing costs when they need it. I do want the committee to be clear here. We are not proposing to take a general and wide-ranging power without providing details of how we intend to use it. Instead, in creating a specific new type of housing assistance in primary legislation, we are setting out two detailed instances of how this type of assistance is to be used. Amendments 161 and 165 enable ministers to introduce regulations to allow local authorities to deliver housing assistance. This will ensure that the support provided to 18 to 21 year olds can continue to be delivered by councils as we move from the interim solution to this more permanent arrangement. Thank you, Minister. 
Do any of the members wish to contribute to the debate? No. Uh, um, Minister, would you like to wind up? Uh, and wind up, wind up formally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 152 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 153 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 152 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 152. 153A, in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. I not move. Thank you. Ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 153. Uh, press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 153 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Um, we now move to the next grouping, which is short-term assistance. And I call Amendment 154 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 155, 155A and 155B. I ask the Minister to move Amendment 154 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to bring forward Amendments 154 and the others in response to uh, clarifications sought by stakeholders such as uh, Carers Scotland and Child Poverty Action Group. These make it clear on the face of the bill our policy intent that short-term assistance will maintain payments at the original level until the redetermination or after that the appeal to first-tier tribunal has been determined. Furthermore, people will also be eligible for short-term assistance when they are seeking permission to appeal. The bill allows a person an unrestricted 31-day period to appeal. After the 31-day deadline, the permission of the first-tier tribunal must be sought. This amendment ensures the availability of short-term assistance for late appeals, both while the request for permission is being considered and if permission is granted until the first-tier tribunal reaches its decision on the appeal itself. Amendments 155A and 155B in the name of Mr Balfour reflect a wholly commendable commitment to ensuring that transitions between systems within the UK are as seamless as possible. We did touch on this previously when discussing residency amendments and as I indicated then, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government entirely share Mr Balfour's concern to get this right. So officials are working together to agree arrangements that will ensure people transitioning between systems experience no gaps in payment or unnecessary administrative burdens. I'm not convinced that using short-term assistance to plug these gaps is the right solution. But if short-term assistance might usefully plug particular gaps, the enabling power in the bill would allow it to be used in that way in any case. So I, I do not recognise the issue that Mr Balfour is raising. Uh, I do recognise the issue that Mr Balfour is raising and believe we have the tools to address it. I hope Mr Balfour will accept my assurance that officials in both governments are working to address his legitimate concerns, uh, which I know are genuinely felt and will not press his amendments in this group. Um, thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Balfour to speak to Amendment 155E and the other amendments in the group? Um, thank you, Convener. And first of all, can I thank the uh, Minister for her remarks uh, this morning, which I think are, are, are very helpful. I, I mean, I think all of us um, recognise that we have a new system coming in, and I think we all welcome the new system. Um, clearly, this system is not just for Christmas, it's for many years beyond that. And what we have to make sure is that we have a system that works going forward as regulations will change and as governments will change. And I think what we don't want to do is end up with an individual um, who perhaps um, is living in uh, Scotland or England or Wales or Northern Ireland not uh, moving because they feel that they're going to have this short-term um, shortfall in regard to um, DLA or PIP or um, other um, benefits that will come forward. Um, I do recognise that this is not a simple piece of work and it will require uh, both Scottish Government and Westminster Government to work together in regard to this, um, and I won't be moving um, these two amendments today because I do hope that the governments can work together and end up with a scheme. Um, can I also welcome Amendment 154, former Minister? I think this does plug a gap which will be helpful for individuals as well, and I think it just gives people an extra layer of protection 
Um, and so um, I welcome 154, and I also welcome what the Minister said in regard to working with the Westminster Government. Thank you, Mr Balfour. Does anyone else wish to contribute to Ms McPherson? Thank you, Convener. Just very succinctly want to say how much I welcome this set of amendments. I think it's extremely important. It will make sure that there is cover in order for people to have the assistance that they need as consideration is given by the first tier tribunal and until such a determination is, is made by the tribunal. I also I warmly welcome Jeremy Balfour's decision to withdraw his amendments while certainly touching on some important points and issues. I think there was some, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the drafting as it was, there were some concerns I had about double claiming and uh, definitions. Um, and I think a, a constructive approach of governments working together and, and, and looking at this later on is, is absolutely the right thing. So I fully support that decision too. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to contribute? Um, Minister, would you like to wind up? Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, can I start by um, expressing my gratitude to Mr Balfour for raising what is an important issue, uh, but also uh, for accepting the concerns that we have and not pressing with his amendments. I think, as, um, uh, as has been said, uh, this is an important addition to our legislative uh, framework. It is a clear signal from us as government and indeed from this committee that we are positively in, uh, supporting individuals who wish to challenge and appeal decisions made by our new social security agency and I do think that is a very important signal uh, to send and a very important practical step that we I hope will take this morning. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question is that Amendment 154 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that section 18 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call amendment 155 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 154, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. I call amendment 155A in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 154, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 155B in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 154, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Thank you. I uh, ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 155. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 155 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 123 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 124 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. I, I call Amendment 125 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Uh, I ask, uh, uh, call Amendment 126 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 4, and ask Pauline McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. The question is that Section 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, we now move to uh, the next group of amendments, which is in form of application. I call Amendment 204 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendments 205 and 210, and ask Mr Griffin to move Amendment 204 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Commissioner. I move Amendment 204 in my name. Um, 204, along with 205 and 210, have been sponsored by Child Poverty Action Group and submitted on their um, advice. And the amendments aim to clarify the process of making an application in relation to whether or not it is validly made. I think whether the application is validly made should mean simply that the questions on the form or asked in a phone call have been fully answered. And this is what regulations should say in relation to the manner in which an application must be made. If it is not validly made, an application can be prevented from proceeding. And I think it should be clear that only basic details um, should prevent an application from being accepted, not evidence that might take some time um, to obtain. Making this 
clear in the bill and in regulations will ensure processes are fit for purpose and provide certainty for people. This amendment would not require either the bill or regulations to specify exact types of information or evidence required, um, so it will not reduce the ability of the system to be flexible and response, responsive and ask members to support the amendments in this group. Thank you, Mr Griffin. Do any of the other members wish to comment on this group? Can I invite the Minister to comment? Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I do not support Mr Griffin's amendments, which would require that the process for applying for assistance be set out in regulations. The concern may be about people's ability to prove that an application has been validly made according to the rules that were operating when the application was made. I understand that, but putting the rules into regulations is not necessary to address that issue. Courts and tribunals are able to look... Sorry? Yes. Whether um, Mr. Griffin's amendments um, replicate the position that it already pertains in UK law in social security regulations, or whether this would be a difference from what happens in UK. In other, in other words, are, is it the case that the law at the moment prescribes in legislation, primary or secondary, that um, uh, as, uh, what a valid form, of it, what a valid application looks like? I, I don't think I know the answer to that question okay. right at the minute, Mr. Tompkins. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe when he's responding, Mr. Griffin could. Maybe when he's winding up, Mr. Griffin could address that question if he knows the answer to it. Indeed. Um, but what I do know is that courts and tribunals are able to look at evidence that does not take the form of regulations. Earlier in these sessions, we have asked them to look at the charter in determining cases, and it does not need to take the form of regulations for them to do that. If the agency has told the public that an application can be made in a particular way, a court or tribunal would, should treat an application made in that way as valid. Uh, a no doubt unintended consequence, Mr Griffin's amendments would limit judges to looking at the regulations when deciding whether an application has been validly made. If ministers wish to alter what was acceptable, for example, to address problems that were being identified through performance reviews of the agency, changes would have to wait until the regulations could be amended. So regulations bring an inflexibility that is not useful here, and there is, in my view, no gain from having them. The committee has already agreed amendments emphasising the importance of inclusive communication, helping people to take up the assistance to which they are entitled. Requiring that the rules for how people can apply be set out in regulations would, in my view, compete with those important aims. Regulations would bring a legalistic approach that would get in the way of telling people simply how to apply for assistance and adjusting requirements where that would be beneficial. Nor does it really give Parliament more meaningful oversight of the rules for applying. If the committee wants to know whether the government is fulfilling its duties to communicate inclusively and do what it can to promote take-up, it can look into what is actually happening on the ground as set out by the commitments in the Charter, drawing on evidence from experts and, most importantly, listening to people who have first-hand experience of applying for assistance. And I would ask Mr Griffin not to press his amendments in this group. Thank you, Minister. Can I ask Mr Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Commissioner. I'm not aware of the situation um, or the, the legal situation across the UK, so I'm not able to comment on uh, Mr. Thompson's question as to whether this is a replication of what already exists. I think my instinct would probably say that that it isn't. Um, I'm still um, of the view that applicants should be given a degree of um, certainty um, to what would and would not constitute um, a valid application, that it should be clear that, again, that it should only be the basic um, details which should prevent an application from um, proceeding and that evidence that might take some time um, to be obtained should not um, hold that up. As I said in my opening, this amendment would not require um, either the bill or regulation to specify exact types of information or, or evidence required. So I don't feel that it would reduce, reduce the ability of the, the system to be flexible and responsive and 
on that basis with press amendment 204. Mr Griffin, the question is that Amendment 204 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Is that no? Sorry. Uh, yes. So there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 204 to please raise their hands? Those against? The result of the Division are five votes for and four votes against, so Amendment 204 has been agreed. I call Amendment 205 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 204, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. move. The question is that Amendment 205 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we are not agreed. There will be a division. I can ask those in favour of Amendment 205 to please raise their hands. Those against? I call any abstentions. Mr Adam, just for clarity, can I ask those against to please raise their hands? Thank you. Any abstentions? Thank you. Um, so the uh, result of the vote are five votes for and four votes against. So therefore, Amendment 205 has been agreed. Uh, we now move to the next grouping of amendments, which is further application for assistance. And I call Amendment 156 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 160, and ask the Minister to move Amendment 156 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you. Amendments 156 and 160 are technical amendments to correct an unintended effect of the restriction placed on repeat applications at Section 20 of the Bill. The types of assistance that most concern these are funeral expense assistance and early years assistance. Uh, these have fairly long application windows and it is entirely impossible that an individual may not be entitled when they first make an application, but their circumstances change and they become eligible within the application window. For example, a woman uh, finds out that she is pregnant, applies for the Best Start grant, but has not yet had confirmation that she is eligible for low-income benefits from DWP. She then receives confirmation of an award of universal credit later during the application window. The amendments will require the agency, when making a determination that a person's claim is unsuccessful, to assess whether the person's eligibility could change at a later date and include this in the decision letter so that the applicant is aware that they can reapply. The agency will then be under a duty to consider a further application from the same person at a later date. Thank you, Minister. Do any members wish to comment? Can I ask the Minister to formally move 156? Move formally. Thank you. Um, does the Minister wish to wind up? Formally. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 156 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And we now move to the next grouping of amendments, which is um, notification to applicant. I call Amendment 167 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendments 81, 168, 169, 170, 83 and 86, and ask Mr Griffin to move Amendment 167 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Camilla. Move Amendment 167 in my name. Um, the amendments in this group uh, require ministers to provide um, a determination in writing um, and have been lodged on the advice of the Child Poverty Action Group. Um, simply seek to ensure that as standard a notification is, is made to an applicant in writing. And nothing in any of these amendments would preclude the communication of the, the decision um, in other uh, inclusive communication formats um, in accordance with the amendments which have been agreed in um, earlier sessions in my name and Ruth Maguire's name. Um, it doesn't detract from the right to have that accessible, accessible information or prevent um, see a decision maker notifying by phone of a decision. Um, Amendment 167, 169, 16, um, Amendment 167, 8, 9 and 70 give the applicant the right to have a clear and thorough 
notification of why a determination has been made and how the agency came to that decision. Um, that has been a key call from Paul Gray and his second independent review into personal independence payments. In its response, the UK government claims that it's not practical to automatically provide those reports to those who have been assessed. Um, but disability charities have said that information in the reports would give those who have been knocked back for personal independence payments more of an understanding on how a decision was reached by the Department of Work and Pensions um, and would look to um, apply that system uh, to the Scottish Social Security Agency. It's specifically, the amendment require ministers to provide a copy of an assessment report as standard and list the rules which have not been satisfied in its determination. Um, I think this would aid tra transparency and subsequent redetermination and appeals processes. Um, clearly, we accept that the Scottish system will get more things right first time, so I feel that this burden um, would be uh, limited and that applicants are unlikely to agree with the original decision, and so ask members to support the amendments in this group. Okay, thank you. Mr Griffin, can I ask if any other members would like to contribute to the debate? No, can I ask the Minister to contribute? Thank you, uh, thank you Convener. Um, I, I cannot support Mr Griffin's amendments in this group as they are currently drafted. Though I understand the motivation behind his amendments, 81, 83 and 86, and I'm happy to work with him to look further at what they propose. These three amendments would change the existing requirements for an individual to be informed of something to a requirement that the person be informed in writing. Although that seems likely to be what would happen anyway, this committee has already agreed to amendments about inclusive communication standards. A duty to inform, coupled with the duty to communicate inclusively, would require ministers to think carefully about how information can best be commu communicated to an individual. These amendments could remove the onus on ministers to do that by saying that telling someone in writing is enough to meet the legal duty. I would be happy to work with Mr Griffin, as I've said, to see if an amendment can be brought forward at stage three, which gives us the best of both of these requirements. I also have concerns about amendments 167, 168 and 170. Section 22 of the bill is already clear. When the agency tells someone of its determination, it has to give reasons. There is case law on what a statutory duty to give reasons requires, and any amendment here ought to take that into account. But these amendments, uh, what they do is require the agency to go beyond explaining the reasons for its decision in a particular case, and provide a full assessment of the person's eligibility against every eligibility rule for the assistance type in question. For example, someone applies for early years assistance and the first thing the agency looks at is whether the residence condition is met. It finds the condition isn't met. That should be enough for the agency to decide that the individual doesn't qualify and send the person a determination explaining that. But an unintended consequence, I'm sure, of these amendments would be to require the agency to go on and assess the person against all the other eligibility criteria for early years assistance. And if the person's original application doesn't provide enough information for that assessment to, be hap to happen, the agency would have to seek that information either from the individual or other public sector bodies. This would undoubtedly slow down the process of issuing decisions, see resources used up assessing an individual against all eligibility criteria, even when it is obvious that the outcome of those assessments will not alter the final determination. Amendment 169 would also impose unnecessary requirements and in some cases might impose inappropriate requirements. It would compel ministers to provide every individual with a copy of an assessment report relating to a determination of their eligibility to assistance, whether they wish that report or not. And it is possible in some circumstances that the information that the agency and ministers have used to reach a determination provides information that that individual uh, is unaware of, particularly in respect of health conditions. 
So it would be my view that the individual should be able to choose whether or not they receive that assessment report. In summary, I agree with Mr Griffin that there should be a duty on ministers to notify individuals of the outcome of their applications, the rationale for reaching the determination and any associated evidence which we relied upon to do so. But there are a number of difficulties with the way in which Mr Griffin seeks to tie down that existing provision. So I would urge him not to press these amendments today and to work with us ahead of stage three to see how these concerns might be addressed. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendments? Thank you, Commissioner. I welcome the Minister's comments um, and the agreement that we have on the broad policy intention of these amendments and would welcome working with the Government ahead of Stage 3 um, to uh, draft a set of amendments that we can all um, agree on um, that um, fulfil the aims, the policy aims that I think that we share. So I would seek committee's um, permission to withdraw Amendment 167. Uh, okay. Committee content that that's withdrawn. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, I call Amendment 81 in the name of Mark Griffin. Already de debated with Amendment 167. Ask Mr McGriffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 168 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 167, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. And I call Amendment 169 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 167, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I call Amendment 170 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 167, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. So the question is that Section 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now move to um, the next group of amendments, which is redetermination and appeal. I call amendment 33 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments shown in the groupings. There's a large grouping in this. I'm not going to read them all out. Uh, and ask the minister to move amendment 33 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'm pleased to bring forward a number of amendments to address the issues raised during stage one. Uh, amendments 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38 and 52 will al allow a redetermination to be requested after the deadline if the person has a good reason for not meeting it. This will carry a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal if refused by the agency. Amendments 82 uh, through uh, relate to the process for initiating appeal an appeal to the first tier tribunal. I have listened to the concerns of stakeholder groups, including Inclusion, Inclusion Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland, that if the process for requesting a redetermination and then a, an appeal is too laborious, people may, as a consequence, drop out of the system and not get what they are entitled to. That is not a result this government wants. The question is how to make the process for challenging a determination as simple as possible, whilst honouring our commitment to a rights-based system which requires individuals to retain control over the choices they want to make. What my amendments would do is simplify the process by requiring the agency to provide to the individual an appeal form alongside the notice of redetermination. If the person wants to appeal to the first tier tribunal, they only send back the completed form saying that they wish to do so. The agency will then be required to hand over to the tribunal all the materials it used to make its determination. That will mark the start of the appeal process, and from that point on, the appeal is in the hands of the tribunal and, rightly, no longer in the hands of the agency. And I would urge members to support these amendments. I do not support Ms McNeill's amendments in this group. The motivation behind her amendments is, I'm sure, much the same as mine to simplify the process for appealing. But I believe that these are, Ms McNeill's amendments would complicate the process for asking for a redetermination. Rather than being able simply to ask the agency to look again at a determination, under these amendments, the, the individual would, at the same time, need to make a choice about whether, after the redetermination is made, the redetermination itself should be referred to the first year tribunal on appeal. I find it difficult to understand how an individual can reasonably be expected to make an informed choice 
critical in a rights-based system before they, they know the outcome of the redetermination. My amendments provide that the individual can choose whether to appeal when they have the redetermination and know what it contains. It will not be obvious to many people whether it would be in their interest to preemptively ask for a tribunal appeal, uh, and indeed I don't believe it would be obvious to me. I have another difficulty in principle with Ms McNeill's amendments and approach, which is that they take control away from the individual and give it to the agency. Under this approach, the agency would be required to submit an appeal on someone's behalf if the person has ticked the box when asking for a redetermination and the redetermination is, more, is not more advantageous to the person. There are many difficulties in defining what would be more advantageous from an individual's perspective. Based, for example, on the current PIP system, there are at least 12 possible outcomes for care and mobility components, with decisions on differing length of awards adding further complexity. So if, for example, the original determination is based on a low care component and middle mobility component and runs for two years, but the redetermination is based on a low care component and low mobility component but runs for five years, which is more advantageous? Under Ms McNeill's approach, it is for the agency but not the individual to make that call. There would also, I believe, be significant impacts on the tribunal service which we should consider. The amendments would likely to result in more cases being sent to first tier tribunal. That is its intention. But if cases are sent to the tribunal with only limited involvement from the individual, it is reasonable to expect that a number of those appeals would not proceed. Having these cases set down in the tribunal's schedule only for them to not call is much more than an administrative inconvenience. We should not underestimate the impact that sort of churn in a tribunal's caseload will have for the speed with which the tribunal can deal with appeals that people genuinely do want to proceed with. So I would urge members to support my amendments, but not Ms McNeill's amendments in this group. Can I invite Polly McNeill to move and speak to Amendment 33A and the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, first of all, I do welcome the progress that has been made in this area because the committee received significant evidence um, that the introduction of mandatory reconsideration had resulted in a dramatic drop in appeals and that people found, applicants found the system onerous. So I do welcome the progress that's been made. Um, however, um, I, I think it's more than a question of simplifying the procedure, as the Minister has said. Um, for many people, for many claimants, they don't realise that it is a two-stage process. There is evidence that many applicants may give up, and it's why we must consider very seriously at this stage of the bill what is the best way to ensure um, that applicants realise that it, could, it is in fact a two-stage process in which they have to make two decisions, the appeal against the original decision and the appeal itself. My primary concern here is that the, the dramatic reduction in appeals on the introduction of the mandatory, which I realise that under our uh, bill will not be mandatory, but there will be a, a reconsideration. The, the only statistics that we have show an 89% drop-off from mandatory reconsideration um, to appeal. It is the most significant feature um, in, in, the, in the system since the introduction. And it's one which I think um, cannot simply be explained um, by adding in this additional part to the process. Um, the purpose of mandatory consideration is to give the person an opportunity to present evidence against the decision for review without the need for a formal appeal process. And I do welcome the fact that under the current system, um, as we previously discussed, um, the approach that the Scottish Government might take to this, would take to this, is you would hope that there will be more successful decisions in the first instance and more successful decisions in the mandatory or the reconsideration process. 
Judge Robert Martin, who is president of the Social Entitlement Chamber of the First Two Tribunals, said that mandatory consideration was based on a false premise as prior to the introduction, the DWP already considered every decision that went to appeal. I think it's significant that he has said that the, that the introduction of mandatory reconsideration was of dubious advantage, uh, whereas in the old system you only had to make um, one appeal. And he also goes on to say that, um, th that there isn't really any real evidence at the moment as to what has discouraged people. Um, and whatever the outcome of these amendments, I, I would urge the government to think, um, at, certainly at stage three, um, whether or not there is some further powers required or some further research required to, to make sure um, that the reason that people don't drop off um, after this introduction of a uh, reconsideration does not prevent them from going on to appeal. I, I want to deal with um, the amendments in my name, which 33A, 193, 84, 194, 87, 8 and 195. So the, my amendments are designed to ask the um, applicant or the claimant when they want to challenge the decision, they were given the option that they could uh, opt for an automatic appeal should the reconsideration be unsuccessful, so that it is a one-stage process. I listened carefully to the Minister during the passage of the Stage 1, and I agree that it should be a rights-based system, but I would argue you would be exercising your right at that stage to ensure that if you were unsuccessful at reconsideration, um, that you could opt for an automatic right to take that to appeal. Um, I think we've got to bear in mind that there are many vulnerable claimants here um, who are put off by the brown envelope arriving in the door, don't know what to do. Um, but I would note that one of the features of, the, um, of my amendments is that the person that would be notified as well had they opted for an automatic appeal, um, that an appeal is pending and they obviously should go and seek representation um, to do so. I think it's an important feature um, uh, in the government amendment that the paperwork for the appeal will go automatically to the tribunal system. So I think that is quite significant um, progress. Um, so I, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a serious question of whether whether this process will ensure that more people will exercise the right um, of appeal. I may not move. I may not. I may seek not to move these amendments, convener, depending on on the debate. Uh, but I certainly will be asking the Minister to consider whether or not, just to be sure and to be in no doubt that the system that we are going to um, have as a support does not prevent people um, from seeking their right to have an appeal um, on their case. And uh, I, I'm not satisfied at the moment that there is enough data um, at the moment to make, to make that determination. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any other members wish to contribute for Mr Balfour? Um, thank you, Convener. Can I, first of all, I think, welcome the amendments in the Minister's name. I, I do think they're very helpful, and I think they also have listened to what we have heard at Stage 1, and um, I've had subsequent emails and letters from different groups. I, I got sympathy with Paul McNeill's amendments. I think it is a, a very tricky balance that we have to strike here between giving the individual control of his or her appeal and my slight concern at the moment as Paul McNeill has drafted them is that we have to make that decision quite early on in the process and I, I do think that does give me slight concern. Um, but we do want the individual to have that right to take the appeal if they want to and if inappropriate. Um, against, we don't want to clog up the system where you end up with the first tier tribunal having um, eight cases before them in a, in a day and three or four people just simply not turning up because they don't want to pursue it. And I think that for me is quite a big concern because what we will end up then is with those who generally do want to go through the whole process and have a, a right of appeal will be delayed because people, maybe not knowingly, just simply not turning up for the appeal. Um, I think the other issue of this, and this is maybe something that could be addressed at regulation um, level later on, is that we do now have 
helpfully within the bill, um, the, legal, the, the, the legal right to advice and assistance. And I think as this goes forward, we have to make sure that the papers that the individual get also goes to their representative. And at the moment, that is a wee bit not happening. And I think that will also give the individual greater protection because the person from CEB or whoever it is is giving that advice will then be able to contact the, the, the claimant and say, do you want to go on to appeal? And here, here's how you do it. And I think that will give greater protection also to the individual that they've got a third party helping them with that process. So um, I am happy to support the ministers. I think at the moment, um, I understand absolutely where Pauline McNeill is coming from, and I think we do want to make sure that there's not this large drop-off. I'm not sure that the way that they're drafted at the moment um, does that. Thank you. Mr. Balfour, does anyone else wish to take Ms. Johnson? Thank you, Convener. I think this obviously was an area of concern for many organisations, and I note now the, the Government Amendment has the support of Citizens Advice Scotland. Um, which does provide some comfort in this area. I've got a lot of sympathy, though, too, for Polly McNeill's amendment, because I think we're all very concerned to see that huge percentage drop-off. And I'd just be interested in the Minister's response if um, she could advise how the government intend to, to keep an eye on this um, and to, to look at any consequences. You know, what would be a satisfactory result in terms of, of appeal numbers in the future? And... Um, I, too, I, I think if we get advocacy and advice right here too, that will have a big impact. Um, so that support may make a positive difference as well in this area. Thank you. Ms Maguire. Um, I think the, the, the main problem I have with the, the automatic um, going through is it's twofold. It's, the person making, having to make their decision at the beginning of a process, I think, I, I understand the intention and I think all of us would wish the whole system and, and people's experience through it to be as easy as possible and we do recognise the barriers that can be there with um, different stages. But I think mainly it's about clogging up the tribunal system. I think that's you know, a really important part of it and as um, Jeremy Balfour said, if there are eight cases sitting with them, but actually only four people are intending to come through. It, it doesn't feel, um, it will have knock-on effects on the people who are wishing to appeal as well. So I, I, I do um, sympathise with where Polly McNeill is coming from. I suppose a question I would have for her and for the Minister would be to ask them what, what work they've done to um, understand what claimants would like to see in terms of appeals. Um, you know, and, and, and what evidence there is. I know that a lot of the evidence we have is from the previous system, and yet that's what we have to look at. But, but what further things can we look to? Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to wish to contribute? Um, can I um, <laughs> ask the Minister to move Amendment 33 and to wind up? Just for the uh, record, thanks. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, can I make a, a, a number of points in response to uh, the debate? Uh, first of all, can I say that I... I do believe that Ms McNeill and I are trying to resolve the same matter here uh, and have much in common. Um, but I need to make a couple of points about the difference between the system that we are designing and indeed this legislation is underpinning and the current UK system. First of all, mandatory reconsideration will not be a feature in the Scottish system. Mandatory re redetermination is a very different exercise. It is an exercise where um, the original decision is not re-looked at on the basis of whether the proper process was followed, but is looked at by an, a, a new individual working in the agency, looking at the case from scratch. So it's a very different starting point. And yes, I, I, I welcome Ms McNeill's acknowledgement that our intention is to uh, operate our system in such a way that many more decisions are got right first time because the right evidence is gathered to support those decisions uh, in that first instance. But, man but redetermination is very different from mandatory reconsideration. In addition, uh, an amendment we have just agreed on short-term assistance uh, is specifically there to ensure that individuals are not prevented from pursuing 
uh, a challenge to the agency's decision making uh, or to appeal on the basis of a financial loss that they have to bear whilst they wait for that process uh, to go through. And I think that is a very important indication of our determination as a government not to dis uh, encourage people from uh, challenging our decisions. For me, a rights-based system requires the individual to be informed in order to exercise their rights. And my uh, central difficulty with Ms McNeill's amendments is that the individual is being asked to make a decision about whether or not they will wish to appeal before they have information about the result of the first challenge they've made, the redetermination. And that the decision about whether or not it is advantageous is out of the hands of the individual and in the hands of the agency. And I think that in a rights-based system, if we mean to uh, embed that through every aspect of what we do, that is um, the wrong approach. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to point out to the, to the committee that uh, under my amendments, their rights would not be undermined uh, by choosing to uh, automatic appeal or not, because they would still have the right at the end of the process if they chose not to have an automatic appeal. It would not undermine the overall right still to take an appeal. I just think that's an important point to get across. Yes, I, und I understand that, but what... I believe to be the case is at the point where the person uh, ticks the box to say not only do I want to challenge the agency's decision but I want to go to appeal, they do not have the information on the basis of the challenge and then we have to go back to them to say do you want to continue with the challenge to appeal stage, unnecessarily complicated. Uh, Ms Maguire helpfully asked uh, what evidence any of us might have for this. Obviously, we all have evidence from uh, stage, uh, stage one discussion and debate and the evidence that was brought to individuals. We have some additional supplementary evidence from our experience panels, uh, albeit that that is limited, but that does indicate that people wish to uh, exercise their rights in a staged manner. In other words, making decisions uh, about each step of the process as they proceed along that process. Uh, so I, I think that the amendments uh, proposed uh, by Ms McNeill, uh, whilst they are trying to achieve the same end as my amendments, uh, unnecessarily complicate matters and uh, ask individuals to make decisions in advance of having the information that they require to make those decisions. On the point about, the two points about the, first about the tribunals. We, we shouldn't, uh, and I think Mr Balfour made this point uh, clearly, we shouldn't um, see the additional burden that this Ms McNeill's amendments potentially puts into the tribunal system simply as an administrative burden. It could have uh, an effect on the speed of the tribunal's decision making uh, for those individuals who are genuinely choosing to pursue an appeal. And that matters because we know that in the current system, one of the difficulties that individuals face is the length of time that they have to wait uh, before uh, tribunals can look at their case. My final point is with respect to uh, the drop-off rate. Of course, the current drop-off rate comes in a system that is significantly different from the one that we are designing and indeed this committee uh, is contributing to the legislation for. Um, so I would expect that the, it is reasonable to say that we will make more decisions uh, correctly first time round, uh, that individuals will challenge those decisions uh, and that the redetermination process is so different from mandatory reconsideration that we would expect to see uh, changed decisions in the redetermination and the individuals may then still proceed to appeal. It, it's not simply ministers who will have oversight of this. This parliament will have oversight of how that uh, system is working, how well or otherwise it's working in a number of uh, aspects, but including this, through the annual report that we uh, have in the bill that ministers will bring to parliament on the performance of the agency against a number of important indicators. Clearly, this is one of them. Uh, so the parliament itself will have oversight over how well the system that I'm proposing 
uh, is operating and will be able to require ministers to, to take steps should we discover that this system uh, requires further improvement. Thank you, Minister. Can you move um, Amendment 33 oh, for the record? My apologies, I move. Thank you. Um, can I invite Pauline McNeill to wind up on Amendment 3 33A and to press or withdraw the amendment? Thank you very much. Um, I think the first thing to say is, I'm sure we all agree, that the right to appeal to have an independent panel decide whether or not yeah, your ap application should be upheld or not is an important principle. Um, and of course, it, one way or the other, it's, it would still be a requirement to go to reconsideration, albeit not mandatory. So I think it's an important uh, principle. I don't really think, I take the Minister's point that the figures, the only figures available which show a quite sharp drop off are the figures that the DWP have for mandatory reconsideration. So I accept that point. Um, however, um, we don't really have any information. We can only really guess, I suppose, as to whether um, my system or the Scottish Government's position uh, are, are likely to prevent a sharper, a sharper drop off. Um, I do think the point that Jeremy Balfour makes about the papers is quite an important one, um, because I do acknowledge in the government's amendments, I think it's a very, very significant development um, that in, the, in those amendments, the paperwork would go direct. I think that's, I think that's very helpful. Um, I have acknowledged that I do agree with the Minister that it's a right-based approach, but as I've said, I just would like to emphasise my amendments would not preclude the rights of the individual to take an appeal should they not opt for an automatic um, appeal. Um, could it have a delay um, in clogging up the tribunal system? Um, well, we don't know. In a Very briefly. Minute. I was just going to address your point, actually. It was, actually on, the, on, it was actually on what you just said there. About, sure, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think the point about, about the rights, be exercising rights, is that for somebody to do that, they need to have all the information so that they can make a decision based on all the information. I think that's the point about it maybe not being compatible with the, with the rights-based approach, is that, of course, yet yeah, they can, they can uh, take the automatic appeal, they cannot take the automatic appeal, then they can change. But if they take it at the beginning, before having all the information, then that's the bit that's at odds with, with it being rights-based. I think that's the point that we would make. Except that all you're asking the applicant at that stage is, is you're saying that should your um, challenge be unsuccessful, would you want to go forward? Uh, automatically to appeal that decision and at the end of the day it's a balance that you want to strike what I, the, the, what I'm trying to get at here which I agree with the minister what we're both trying to get at here is to address what's been a very significant problem under the old system um, and that is balancing all of that with the, the concern that there, but there will be people who will drop off because they will not realize it's a two-stage process could it have uh, an impact of clogging up the tribunal system? Um, well, we don't know the answer to that. I would concede, however, that the system that the Scottish Government have already outlined where uh, their approach to reconsideration um, should ensure that there would be less appeals, you would think, um, because that would be a fresh look um, at the original decision. Um, I'm not going to press and I'm going to seek to withdraw, but I just wanted to get on the record that that was my overall purpose and I would want to return to the sit stage three. And the only thing I would ask the Scottish Government to consider on all of this is to whether or not there should be a commitment to review and to get some research if we find at the early stages um, of the new system in operation does result in uh, a concerning drop in the number of people who choose to take up their right to appeal. Thank you. Um, can I ask the committee content that 33A be withdrawn? Thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 33? Uh, press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Uh, I call Amendment 34 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you. The question is that Section 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 35 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Amendment, call Amendment 36 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? So I call Amendment 82 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 83 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 167, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 193 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask Ms McNeill to move or not move. 190, you look Not moved. Thank you. Call Amendment 84 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. I call Amendment 84A in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask Polly McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. Ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 84. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 25 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 85 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 33 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 86 in the name of Mark Griffin already debated with Amendment 167 and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 194 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask Ms McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 87 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. formally. I call Amendment 87A in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 33, and thank you. I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 87. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 88 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 33 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. I call Amendment 88A in the name of Pauline McNeill. Not already moved. debated. Thank you. Not moved. Uh, so I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 88. Press. Thank you. The question is that 88 to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, before we move to the next group, I'm going to call a comfort break for 10 minutes maximum. Please be back here at um, 10.35 at the very least. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, welcome back. My apologies. I didn't stop just before um, a new grouping. Um, we have some other um, uh, amendments to consider. I'd like to call Amendment 89, 90, 91, 92, 93 and 37, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I would invite the Minister to move Amendments 89 to 93 and 37 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 89 to 93 and 37. Thank you. If uh, the question is that amendments 89 to 93 and 37 are agreed, are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that section 28 be agreed, are we all agreed? I call amendment 195 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment 33. Ms McNeill to move or not moved. Thank you. You now move to the new group, which is first year tribunal power to determine entitlement. I call amendment 206 in the name of Polly McNeill and a group in its own, and I invite Ms McNeill to speak and move amendment 206. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, I think um, the amendment is designed to ensure that a tribunal need not consider any part of the claim of which the claimant is satisfied with and the intention was to ensure that um, a tribunal could, could to have the power to only uh, visit the aspect of the claim that the claimant was unsatisfied um, with. Um, I'm probably going to be satisfied that the tribunal already has the power to do that, in which case I would seek withdrawal, um, but it would just be helpful to get that on the record, convener. Thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to speak to this debate? Can I ask the Minister to contribute to the debate? Thank you, Convener. Um, tribunal procedural rules provide that first-year tribunal may look at any issue in considering an appeal and not just the points of dispute raised by the appellant. That is for the tribunal to decide. It can look broadly or it can look narrowly. Tribunals can make significantly different findings of fact from the original decision-maker Ministers cannot restrict a tribunal's authority or direct it in its deliberations as tribunals are independent and judicially led. Um, it would seem to me the amendment could appear to tie the tribunal's hands in calculating what an individual is entitled to. Um, the appellant, in particular one without the support of a welfare rights officer, may not have specified all of the potential grounds of appeal. The tribunal might identify things that the individual has missed. Conversely, the tribunal may consider that part of a determination is plainly wrong, even though the appellant is not disputing it. Clearly, the tribunal would want to make what it considers to be the right decision. These are matters for the tribunals to decide, not for the bill. And I would urge members, and I would urge Ms McNeill, indeed, not to press this amendment. 
Thank you, Minister. Can I ask Pauline McNeill to wind up and press or withdraw her amendment? I am satisfied with that response and I would seek to with withdraw that amendment. Thank you. Are the committee content that be withdrawn? Thank you. Um, the question is that section 29 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I now call amendment 38 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally. The question is that amendment 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, we now move to new grouping on first tier tribunal ordinary members and I call amendment 127 in the name of Polly McNeill in a group on its own and ask Ms McNeill to move and speak to amendment 127. Um, thank you very much. Um, this was an amendment I, I submitted after discussion with um, Sam H um, who have ex some experience um, of the tribunal system. Um, primary role of the tribunal is to consider and determine applications for, uh, in the case um, of compulsory treatment orders under the Mental Health Act, to consider appeals against compulsory measures. And a key feature of the Mental Health Tribunal is that every sitting member is presided over by three members, a legal member who acts as convener, a medical member and a general member. Uh, the general member is someone who has lived experience of a mental health disorder. Um, so this amendment would seek to ensure that, that one of the uh, members of the uh, tribunal uh, would have lived experience. Um, I, think it's, I think it's good practice. Um, I, I'm presuming, of course, the intention would be, uh, although I'm not clear, about whether or not there will be a three-panel uh, tribunal in every case. Um, however, it seemed to me to be a good balance to strike in the system, um, which is the bold. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any other, uh, Mr. Balfour? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Just a couple of points in regards to this. I mean, I think first of all, I'm not sure this is in the right bill yeah. um, and in the right place. Um, obviously, we have seen in regard to um, papers, the draft um, regulations in regard to how tribunals will be run, which I think is going to the Justice Committee, but may well be leaked us, at us at a, a later stage. And I think if this was going to happen it should appear there, not within this particular bill. I also have to say, and probably should, again, just remind the committee that I was an ordinary member of the tribunal, that uh, I actually think this would exclude a number of people from sitting on the tribunal who come with a lot of experience, just in regard to the way it is worded at the moment. And so I think there is a danger, actually, that we could lose experience of people who have physical or mental illness as an ordinary member as it is worded. I'm sure that's just an unfortunate drafting and it could probably tied up at stage three if it was to be moved. But my own view is that this is not particularly helpful uh, in this bill and we should look at it when the Justice Committee looks at the, how the tribunals work and that would seem to me in a more appropriate place to have that debate. Alfred, does anyone else wish to contribute? Can I invite the Minister to contribute? Convener, um, I have no difficulty with the principle um, that Ms McNeill's amendment aims to achieve. The ordinary members of the tribunal should come from a range of experiences. However, Mr Balfour is correct. The bill is not the mechanism for achieving this. The mechanism is the tribunal regulations under the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014. Uh, and as the committee has been reminded by Mr Balfour, on the 22nd of January, we launched a public consultation on the full suite of regulations needed for creating a new chamber in Scottish tribunals to hear social security appeals. The draft eligibility for appointment regulations provide for the appointment of ordinary members with two types of specialism, medical and disability. The disability criteria have been expanded to align with the definition of disability in Section 6 of the Equality Act 2010. That ensures that the meaning of disability covers not just physical disability, but also mental impairment. These members would be involved in situations where medical issues fall to be determined in connection with entitlement to disability assistance or employment injury assistance. The consultation proposes that in all other cases it would be dealt with by the legal member sitting alone. But the point of the, of the draft of the consultation on the draft regulations is, of course, to hear views. The consultation uh, on the draft uh, closes on the 16th of April, uh, and I can assure both Ms. McNeill and this committee that care will be taken in considering and balancing 
any views expressed on eligibility for appointment and as to which members should sit on different tribunals. I would ask Ms McNeill not to press this amendment, uh, but would urge her and indeed other members of the committee to respond to the current consultation uh, and we would then take matters forward in the appropriate manner. Thank you, Minister. Um, can I invite Polly McNeill to firstly move the amendment, uh, just for the, the record, to Ms McNeill, and then to wind up and press or withdraw. Okay, um, should have moved it in the first instance. Um, so, in, in winding up, convener, um, I'll seek not to. Uh, I'll seek withdrawal. Um, I, I'm persuaded by uh, both Jeremy Balfour and the minister that perhaps this is not the place. Although I still stand by the, the substantial point in the amendment, um, I would say the discussion I would like to have with the committee at a later stage, because I think there's a, a close interest that the committee should have um, on the operation of the tribunal system and the consultation ongoing, because there's a very, very close relationship between the work that we are doing and the tribunal system. Perhaps we should be a secondary committee. I don't know. It's a discussion I would like to have. On that basis, I would agree it's not the appropriate place to have this discussion, and I would seek withdrawal, convener. Thank you. Can I have approval that that be withdrawn from the committee? Thank you. Um, we now move to uh, the next group, which is obligation to provide information. And I call Amendment 196 in the name of Mark Griffin and a group on its own and ask Mr Griffin to move the amendment and to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I move Amendment 196 in my name. Um, briefly, the, um, this amendment has been lodged uh, with the support of Child Poverty Action Group and removes the possibility that if someone is asked to provide information, um, for example, a payslip or a medical test and they simply can't, um, that they then could automatically be ref uh, refused their entitlement. And well, um, I recognise that this is not the policy intention that's intending not to be negative. The legislation should not enable the, the possibility of um, this practice. Um, I feel as drafted, this provision goes beyond the general practice under the current UK um, benefit system. Um, a fair provision could be that the agency may go ahead and decide uh, the award based on the evidence that is available. Um, but I'm interested to hear the, the comments of the, the government on this particular amendment. Thank you. Governor, does anyone else wish to contribute to the debate, Mr. McPherson? Th thank you, Convener. Just very quickly, I think to me this section provides something that's y useful and important, and that will make sure that decisions are made and that there aren't out outstanding collections of data lying with the agency. I think I, I just wonder if data protection is an issue here that we need to think of and be mindful of. And I would put that question to, to Mr Griffin and, and to the Minister. Do any other members wish to come in? No, can I invite the Minister? Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, can't support Mr Griffin's Amendment 196. Section 32, 30 brackets 2 of the Bill is a technically important provision that cannot be left out. Section 30 deals with the situation where the agency does not have the information it needs to make a determination about someone's eligibility. Subsection 1 uh, lets the agency request that information from the individual, and I want to emphasise here that it only allows information to be requested if the information is necessary for a determination to be fully made. If the agency has asked someone for information, allowed a reasonable period for a reply, and has not received it, then the, the agency needs to be able to determine the application at some point. That is what subsection 2 of section 30 is for, to allow ministers to fulfil the duty that section 19 place of the bill places on ministers to make a determination of a person's entitlement. Because we're talking about a situation in which the agency lacks some information that it needs to decide what the individual is entitled to, Therefore, there has to be some legal basis for the agency to make a determination in the absence of that information. Otherwise, as Mr. Uh, McPherson uh, hinted at, the agency would have to keep the application open and would have to hold the personal information of the individual in question in perpetuity. That is at odds with data protection principles, only to hold information for the purposes for which it is needed. I should stress that section 30, subsection 2, 
is not saying that without the information, an application will inevitably fail. There may be cases where information is sought to decide whether a person qualifies for a higher rate of award, and information already held justifies an award at a lesser rate. My issue with this amendment is that it leaves applications hanging where an individual has applied but failed to provide what has been sought from them. And I don't believe that is either appropriate or helpful. So for those reasons, I would invite Mr Griffin not to press his Amendment 196. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Commissioner. On the basis of uh, the information from the government, um, I would seek um, Commit's permission not to, uh, to withdraw this amendment. Thank you. Um, is the com committee content to have that withdrawn? Thank you. The question is that section 30 be agreed. Are we all agreed? You now move to uh, and the next group, which is medical assessments. And I call amendment 207 in the name of Alison Johnson. Group with amendments 208, 171 and 172. And I ask Ms Johnson to move amendment 207 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, I stood for election on a manifesto commitment to reduce the number of assessments used to assess eligibility for devolved benefits, and I believe that SNP members of the committee campaigned on a similar commitment, um, their 2016 manifesto stated, to stop the revolving door of assessments and related stress and anxiety for those with long-term illnesses, disabilities or conditions. Well, amendments 207 and 208 aim to do just that. The principle established in Amendment 207 is that pre-existing evidence should be fully considered before insisting on an assessment, where already existing evidence is sufficient to corroborate what the applicant has claimed on their application. We really shouldn't be asking them to undergo unnecessary assessments, which can, for some people, be highly stressful experiences that exacerbate conditions and illness. Now, I haven't been prescriptive in how this should be done, what the standard should be for deciding what pre-existing pre-existing evidence is sufficient is a matter for Scottish ministers. But not putting people through unnecessary assessments is an important principle we should establish in law. And it's also a matter of practicality and efficiency because current PIP assessments can cost up to £200. If an assessment is required, however, Amendment 208 asks Scottish ministers to consider a range of different options with a view to consider ministers to to look at uh, forms of assessment that may be less taxing and stressful than face-to-face. -face. And where face-to-face -face is absolutely essential, the amendment asks ministers to look at the distance from home that the person will have to travel to the centre um, and any adverse effects that travel might have. And it also specifically highlights the possibility of assessing applicants in their own homes. And to be absolutely clear here, the intention is not to stop assessments from being done when they're necessary to determine entitlement. Um, and I know the Minister shares these aims. In January, the Minister outlined a very similar process to the Commons DWP Select Committee and has made comments to the, uh, that effect in this chamber. Um, I'm pleased to note the support that I have for this amendment from Inclusion Scotland, Citizens Advice Scotland and the Child Poverty Action Group. So, um, if we are to found this new system, as the Scottish Government intends to, rightly, on the principles of dignity and respect, then protecting applicants from unnecessary assessments that can, however, unintentionally cause distress is one way to create such a, such a system. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms Rodson. Can I invite Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 171 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Commissioner. Amendments 171 and 172 are sponsored by um, Sam H. And the intention behind these amendments is that where any face-to-face -face assessment for disability assessment is requested, the person conducting the assessment should have professional experience of mental health if the person being assessed has a mental health condition. Research from Sam H has highlighted significant problems with the manner in which face-to-face -face assessments for PIP um, work for people with mental health um, conditions. And these include a, a lack of understanding of the impact of mental health by assessors, face-to-face -face assessments, inability to accurately assess the impact of fluctuating conditions, and stigmatising attitudes and behaviours by some assessors. The cumulative impact of those 
feelings has been a loss of trust in the PIP assessment process and in some cases a deterioration of applicants' mental health. In Mind, which is Sam H's sister charity in England, surveyed 800 people with mental health problems on their experience of PIP and only 8% felt that their assessor understood the impact of their the impact their mental health problem had on them as an individual. And we welcome the, the government's intention to reduce face-to-face -face assessments for disability benefits, um, but still feel this amendment provides a safeguard for those applicants who would still require such an assessment. Um, and on top of that, a reduction in assessments should make it easier to provide condition-specific assessors since demand for assessment should be lower. It will also contribute to building trust between the new Scottish social security system and applicants, which I think is essential for its uh, long-term effectiveness and ask members to support the amendments in this group in my name. Thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to contribute, Mr Balfour? Uh, uh, thank you. Can I say, first of all, in regard to Mark Griffin's amendment, I absolutely support the way that he is going um, about it, and um, I think it is the right way forward. Uh, my, my slight concern is in regard to the actual wording of the amendment, um, where he says it's assessment of the individual's mental health. I, I, and my understanding of that is not actually what the assessment is about. It's about how the mental health impacts the individual's yes. needs to live uh, his day-to-day -day or his, uh, her day-to-day -day life. And, and, I, and I'm not sure the wording is absolutely right in regard to that. And I wonder whether in his summing up, he would either withdraw the amendment and bring back a fresh one at stage three, or maybe give some kind of, um, or the minister would, would comment on it in regard to whether the wording is actually the intended what is intended to happen. Um, I think the other issue that we just have to be wary of, um, and this will be uh, an issue, I think, for the government going forward, is are there enough people out there that have that experience that can do the assessments? But that doesn't make it wrong. We just need to make sure there are the right people. But I think um, I am very sympathetic to what the um, amendment is trying to do. I'm just not absolutely sure the wording is absolutely right. Um, I, I don't support Alison Johnson's two amendments um, in regard to this. I, I suppose I am one of a few people, and uh, I don't want to provoke my uh, colleagues across the road or across the table from having another go at assessments, but I was somebody who went through an assessment, and it was very positive. And I appreciate a lot of people haven't had that, and I've seen I've woken up at least a couple of members, um, haven't had that. But if you go back even to the 1980s, 1980s we had assessments done. I, my first time I went for DLA, I was assessed. And I think that what we've got to be careful here is to say, for some people, assessments will actually help them get the benefit that they require because we have that face-to-face -face integration that you can never get from reading a bit of paper about a person. And I think the other danger that we have is that, yes, the agency has to collect, and I think the Minister's right, has to collect as much information as we can get about that person, but sometimes that information is just not available or is actually very hard to get. And the quickest way for an individual is, with the right form of assessment, with the right support, is to go through that assessment and have that. And, and I, I am slightly concerned that we end up um, actually making claimants' lives harder because they're not getting that assessment at that appropriate time and done in the appropriate way. And so um, I think there is an argument for some assessments to be done at home. Again, that is what happened on quite a number of occasions. Um, it used to be that the first year tribunal would hear a case first and then assess if a, that um, assessment was done face to face and they would arrange that. And that may be something that we want to look at regulations later on. But I'm just concerned that as the amendments are written by Alison Johnson at the moment, that actually we could be making life more difficult for people to be able to get it. I accept that the assessments maybe aren't done that well at the moment on some situations, but that doesn't mean that assessments aren't actually a good way because you can quite quickly assess someone. And I think that's why often tribunals make very different decisions 
because we see a person and it's not just a paper exercise. Mr. Tompkins, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, thank you very feel? briefly. I, I can't support the amendments in this group um, uh, because they uh, um, fail to understand, I think, what is being assessed. Um, we're, we're not talking about medical assessments. We're not talking about assessments of people's medical condition or, or treatment or anything else. We're talking about assessments of the needs that people have arising out of their disability or um, health uh, condition. And Alison Johnston's amendments fail to recognise that, as does the wording of Mark Griffin's um, amendment, which I would otherwise welcome um, on, uh, on mental health. So um, we won't be supporting any of the amendments in this group. We won't be voting against Mark Griffin's amendments because the, the principle is the right one, but, the, but it need, it, it, the, his amendment would need to be amended before we could support it because it uses the phrase, an assessment of the individual's mental health. That is not what is happening in his assessment. It is an, it is an assessment of the needs that the individual has arising out of their mental health, and that is a very different thing. Thank you. Minister, would you like to contribute? Thank you, Convener. Um, can I start with Mr Griffin's amendments? Uh, I do agree uh, with the principle behind these, that individuals should be assessed by professionals who understand the specific conditions uh, and the impact of those conditions on the individual, and our arrangements should provide for the needs of those with mental health conditions. Um, the Scottish Government has placed a clear emphasis on getting assessment decisions right first time, every time, and the use of appropriately trained, or as I have referred to them before, condition-specific assessors would help us to achieve that. And I do agree with Mr Griffin that in many cases, mental health assessments would be best dealt with by people with professional experience of mental health. Unfortunately, to commit to implementing these amendments as drafted would inadvertently mean increasing the risk that individuals with mental ill health may not be effectively assessed for other conditions or disabilities which they may have, particularly when the mental health condition is not the primary condition. People frequently present with multiple conditions, insisting that everyone who has any kind of mental health condition to any degree is assessed only by a mental health professional may result in some people not getting the uh, right assessor or assessment for them, particularly if their primary condition is physical. The Scottish Government has consistently argued, and I am on record as uh, has been noted, uh, for condition-specific assessors, and we're working with our stakeholders and experienced panels to see how we can best implement this moving forward. I know that, like myself, Mr Griffin wants to see the best possible assessment outcomes for individuals with mental health conditions. Um, I would urge Mr Griffin to consider not pressing the amendment uh, so that we may work uh, together for stage three to improve on its current wording. Uh, but if uh, he does wish to press, then we will support the amendments, but will wish to come back at stage three in order to make uh, what I consider to be some improvements to them. Moving to the amendments from Ms Johnson, again, I wholeheartedly agree with the principle behind them that face-to-face -face assessments should be conducted only when completely necessary and that when assessments are required, they meet the needs of the individual. And we remain committed to reducing the number of face-to-face -face assessments that are required. To do that, we do focus on the initial stage of the process, as others have commented. However, Assessments are undertaken in order to determine the impact of the individual's uh, disability or ill health condition, as Mr Tompkins has outlined. And therefore, the assessments are not medical assessments. They are assessments, uh, if you like, of impact, because that is the purpose of the benefit. Uh, I know that uh, Ms Johnson and I share uh, the same intent uh, in terms of assessments, the same intent in terms of determining uh, when assessments are required and when they are unnecessary, and indeed many of the, much of the same intent in terms of process that should be gone through by the agency uh, in reaching that view, including uh, ensuring that assessments are made as close to the individual as possible and at home where that is desirable. However, I would urge Ms Johnson to withdraw these amendments on the basis that I am open to continuing to work together to ensure that assessments are only undertaken when necessary, and if required, we can come back at stage three. Thank you. Minister, can I invite Ms Johnson to wind up and to press or withdraw her amendment? Um, thank you, convener. Um, I, I'll, 
I think I'll begin with um, addressing Mr Balfour's comments, if I may. Um, I think Mr Balfour frequently shares his own experience with, with, um, with members and personally I think it's really important that we don't ever assume our own experience is one that is universally shared. Um, Citizens Advice Scotland in their briefing for, for, for today say from consultation with several hundred cab clients and advisors the highest priority that's the highest priority for the Scottish social security system was that the number of unnecessary medical assessments for disability benefits is substantially reduced by making the best use of existing evidence you know their their submission really does um, you know support the the fact that for a lot of people this is a stressful unnecessary um, process that they're not being treated with people aren't being treated with di dignity and respect on every occasion it speaks to a poor quality of decision making charges for medical assess ass evidence and people on DLE losing their award on reassessment so it's clear there's a lot of improvement can be done in this area um, I, I you know I'm aware that Mr Tompkins and the Minister um, have concerns around the word medical. I warmly welcome the Minister's support for the principle of my amendments, and I certainly wouldn't want any assessments left out of the process, uh, any evidence left out of the process that might help an individual access entitlement. So if a, if a rewording of the amendment means that fewer people have to be assessed unnecessarily, then I'm, I'm very prepared to work on the wording of my amendment with the government to bring them back at stage three, as clearly we do share the same intent. And I think this is a really important issue um, and one that we should all seek to get right. So with the approval of the committee, I will withdraw my amendment at this stage. Okay. Uh, does the committee approve that withdrawal? Thank you. Um, I call Amendment 208 in the name of Alison Johnson already debated with Amendment 207 and ask Alison Johnson to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Um, we move to um, the next grouping, which is appointees, and I call Amendment 157 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 158 and 159, and ask the Minister to move Amendment 157 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, these amendments are technical adjustments. They provide the new agency with the power to appoint individuals or organisations to act on behalf of a person who appears to be eligible for assistance but who is unable to act for themselves and has no nobody authorised to act on their behalf. The effect of these amendments will be to ensure that individuals who do not have the mental or physical capacity to act themselves are able to access and receive all of the assistance they are entitled to under the new Scottish system. They also allow an appointee to be made when someone has died and there is no executor of their estate. Where an appointee is made, they will take on the rights and responsibilities for the person eligible for Scottish Social Security. And I move Amendment 157. Thank you, Minister. Do any other members wish to contribute? No. Uh, Minister, do you wish to wind up? Uh, formally. Thank, thank you. you. The question is that Amendment 157 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 158 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 157 and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally. The question is that Amendment 158 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. The question is that Section 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 159 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 157 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. So the question is that 159 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 8 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 171 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 207, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Um, if the convener is able to give me a bit of a, a leeway, um, just to welcome the comments of the committee members and the unanimous support for the principle behind the amendment and welcome that, and would look to work with government and members of the committee towards um, agreeable wording that fulfils the policy aim that I think we are all share, and on that basis um, seek not to lodge 171. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 160 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 156, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. 
Uh, the question is that Amendment 160 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 128 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 4, and ask Polly McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. Call Amendment 129 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 4, and ask Ms McNeill to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. The question is that Section 35 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 191 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 182, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. And we move to the next grouping, which is assistance no longer required. And I call Amendment 197 in the name of Mark Griffin in a group on its own and ask Mr Griffin to move and speak to Amendment 197. Thank you, Commissioner. I move Amendment 197 in my name. Um, I appreciate that the motives behind this amendment aren't immediately obvious, um, and hopefully I, I'll be able to explain that, that this amendment seeks to give people a right to... Uh, cease receipt of assistance um, at any point and effectively say that um, they no longer wish to receive a, a particular form um, of assistance. Uh, Child Poverty Action Group highlight that as currently allowed under UK law, um, it's important that people are able to withdraw their application once they have a award, once they have an award that, and that there are um, circumstances when a person might want to stop getting a particular benefit even though they are still in, entitled to it. Um, the example that I would give is that um, this might happen when a, a couple um, has a choice between the two in the relationship as to who receives that particular um, benefit. The couple has a choice about um, which in the relationship makes the application um, and receives that assistance. A Child Poverty Action Group highlight um, the example of a couple who care for their disabled child. Um, one gets carer's assistance for their child but has their own health condition. Um, they get universal credit and in universal credit there are extra amounts for someone who gets a carer's benefit and for someone who has a health condition but not both unless they are different people. And if they couldn't withdraw their claim um, to then allow their other partner to claim and receive it, they could be in a situation where they could be over £150 a month worse off because uh, their universal credit wasn't able to include um, the carer's um, element. But um, I'm happy to uh, listen to the, the debate around this particular uh, amendment and, and how it's worded um, from other members of the committee and the government. Mr Griffin, does any other member wish to make a contribution? I can invite the Minister to comment. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to support the principle behind Mr Griffin's Amendment 197, but I would ask him not to press it today for technical reasons. There can indeed be situations in the benefit system where it would be sensible for people to choose to stop receiving assistance, as that may allow them or related persons to claim other assistance instead. The committee has agreed amendments around ministers' duty to promote take-up and income maximisation, so it may be beneficial to have an express statement that a person can decline assistance despite those duties since there is an apparent contradiction between them. It may be clearer to make the statement earlier in the bill, and it seems to me unnecessary to require that a person has to state their choice in a particular way or ways and to have to publicise what those ways are. Ministers would no doubt try to ensure that a person was making an informed choice, but that seems to me to be something best left to good practice in the usual situations where it arises. Concerns about the wording and the location of the amendment suggest to me that it would be better to look at this in the light of other amendments and bring something forward at stage three. So I'm happy to work with Mr Griffin on that, and on that basis I would ask him not to press the amendment today. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to um, press or withdraw his amendment and wind up? Thank you, Commissioner. I welcome the government's um, comments. And uh, aside from the, the duty to maximise incomes of, of an individual, I think we should also look at that uh, wider holistic picture and be looking to, to maximise the incomes of a household as well as an individual, which might, and those two things might well be in conflict. Um, 
which is something that I think we can consider um, in advance of stage three and look forward to working with the government on that basis and um, withdraw um, Amendment 197. Right. Is the committee content for that to be withdrawn? Yes. Thank you. Um, we now move to um, the group um, recovery of assistance. I call Amendment 40 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 41, 42, 43, 44 and 45. And I invite the Minister to move Amendment 40 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. The Scottish Government has always been clear that overpayments made as a result of official error will not normally be recovered unless there are exceptional circumstances. The Committee acknowledged this in its Stage 1 report and reflecting the concerns of stakeholders such as Inclusion Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland, asked the Government to make the position clear on the face of the Bill. Uh, I am happy to bring forward amendments to do that. This has re required us to widen the scope of overpayment liability to encompass all types of error through Amendment 40, then set out a qualification for when that liability exists under Amendment 43. These amendments mean that an individual will only be liable for an overpayment when the mistake was their fault or that it was reasonable for them to notice that an overpayment had occurred. The amendments will also bring all types of error resulting in an overpayment under this statutory framework, meaning that government cannot rely on the common law rules of unjustified enrichment to recover overpayments. This further increases transparency around an important issue, and I hope members will be able to welcome the amendments in my name. Amendment 45 is a technical amendment. When a person dies, the cost of their funeral is a priority debt that takes precedence over most other debts where there is money in the deceased person's estate. The amendment confirms that this normal legal rule applies where funeral expense assistance has been given to someone. For example, this means that if a person leaves assets that can be used to meet the costs of their funeral, but a person needs assistance to meet these costs up front, then assistance can be given and its costs then recovered from the estate in the usual way. The committee will note that Amendment 45 enables recovery from the deceased person's estate, but does not enable recovery from the person who is assisted. This is in line with the usual approach to these matters, and I move Amendment 40. Thank you, Minister. Um, does anyone else wish to contribute? Mr Griffin? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we we'll support these um, amendments today. I think we would um, seek to work with the, the Government and the Minister ahead of um, Stage 3 and look for cooperation then to improve on particular areas um, that we feel can be improved. And without the Government amendments, people are liable to repay an overpayment caused by official error um, and there is no right of appeal against recovery of an overpayment. And with the Scottish Government amendments, people are liable to pay, repay an overpayment caused by official error if a reasonable person should have noticed the error. And people are not liable to, repeat, to repay an overpayment if it was not their fault, nor could they have been expected to notice the error. But there is still um, no right of appeal against recovery of an overpayment. Um, I think the Minister's amendments are, are considerable improvement, um, but I think... Can take uh, an intervention? Yep, on... certainly. Uh, I'm obliged. Um, would um, you agree that at the moment, under the present system, um, the individual does have a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal, and that would be a, a, a safeguard that could be looked at at stage three? Yep, I, I was just coming on to that point. Thank Mr Balfour for that um, intervention. As it currently stands... Um, people would have to have um, go to court um, for an appeal, meaning an, an unnecessary call on legal aid budgets on court time and presents a, a fairly substantial barrier to justice um, for people. As Mr Balfour pointed out, the current UK system has a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal. Um, I feel that the test of liability to, to repay is too strict and stricter than it is currently for virtually all DWP uh, benefits. I think the, the bill should provide for regulations setting out the, the methods of recovery. Evidence has shown that deductions from benefits causes hardship and having a limit on the level of deduction from benefit in law would give protection to vulnerable people, uh, many of um, whom would struggle um, if, there was no, if there was no protection on the amount of deductions that um, were taken 
on a weekly or a monthly basis. But like I said, I do support the considerable improvement that these amendments um, present, but would look to work with the government ahead of stage three on some of the issues that I have flagged. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Minister, would you like to wind up? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, can I simply wind up by concentrating as best I can on what Mr. Griffin has said? Um, I'm very happy to continue. I'm grateful to you for your support uh, and happy to continue discussions in advance of stage three and whether or not further improvements can be made. Um, I should just make it clear, though, that it is possible to appeal recovery if the deductions uh, are, are made, and you do that through the first tier tribunal. Uh, and uh, the DWP makes freestanding recovery deductions, uh, which is not something that we propose. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm grateful for the support and happy to continue the discussion um, with Mr. Griffin and other committee members if they wish in advance of stage three uh, to see if further improvements can be brought forward, which the government would agree to. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question is that Amendment 40 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes thank you. Um, call Amendment 41 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40 and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. The question is that Amendment 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 42 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. And the question is that Amendment 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 43 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? And the question is that Section 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 44 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Uh, the question is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 45 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40 and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious of time, um, but um, do you think we should? This is to you. Yeah. We wouldn't, yeah. We wouldn't want mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm minded of time. Um, we're now at 20 past 11 uh, with a, a, a stop time of approaching half past. Given that the, the next grouping is um, a significant grouping, I'm going to suspend for today um, and return to stage two proceedings next week. And um, a new marshalled list and groupings will be issued um, to the committee. And I thank everyone for their attendance this morning. Thank you.